A warm welcome to my lecture today on groin swelling and inguinal hernias. This is the last lecture in the series on groin swellings and inguinal hernia. Part 1 of the lecture is on groin swellings. The second part, which I will do later, will be on inguinal hernia. This slide shows you the exact location of what the groin is. This is the area. It's a groin. So the groin is the junction between the abdomen and the thigh. So the crease is the inguinal crease here. Okay, groin crease marks the center of the groin. So the important structures that are organized are the upper part of the thigh, lower part of the abdomen, especially the inguinal region, as well as the upper part of the scrotum or the vulva in females. Okay, what is a groin swelling? A groin swelling, a number of causes. Huh? The common causes will be uh, inguinal hernia, either direct or indirect inguinal hernia, or it can also be a femoral hernia. It can be an enlarged lymph node, lymphadenopathy, or lymphadenitis, or a cyst such as a epidermal or sebaceous cyst. These are the three most common conditions in, in our patients. The less common conditions include vascular lesions such as saphina varix, femoral artery and femoral artery aneurysms. Testicular swellings, especially related to the cord, undescended testes in children, and encysted hydrocele of the cord, also in children. It can be painless or painful. Painful, the causes are usually due to strangulated hernia, infected cysts, lymphadenitis, torsion of the testis, epididymo orchitis, and referred or radiated pain to the inguinal region. Okay, these are the differential diagnoses for groin patient with groin swellings. Okay, the most common is your inguinal of hernia. The others include varicocele, hydrocele, epididymochitis, torsion of the testis, undescended testis, ectopic testis, testicular tumor, femoral artery aneurysm, lipoma, and lymphadenopathy. Okay, these are some pictures to show you, illustrate some groin swellings. This is a case of a groin swelling here. Okay, clinically, this can be a irreducible hernia, inguinal hernia or femoral hernia, most likely inguinal because it's above the inguinal ligament. Or it can even be a lymph node or a lipoma. Okay, here is a elongated lump. Okay, elongated lump from the inguinal region extending to the upper scrotum. Most probably, it is an indirect inguinal hernia. Okay, these two lumps are bilateral inguinal hernias, can be direct or indirect. This is a swelling, large swelling in the inguinal groin, which can be an inguinal hernia, or a cyst, or even be a femoral hernia. Here, a case of infected lymphadenitis in the inguinal region, inguinal lymphadenitis. Okay, this is swollen and tender and red. This is another case of a lymphadenitis. In this case, it is not inflamed. So this is a limb node, linguinal limb node. Okay, another case of a linguinal limb node, which is not inflamed. It can be uh, lymphadenitis or can be due to malignancy, either primary or secondary deposits. This is a case of a saphina varix. Is a dilatation of the long saphenous vein at the entrance at its entrance into the femoral vein in patients with varicose vein. You can see a bluish discoloration, suggestive it is a venous congestion. This is an infected epidermal cyst with some discharging of pus from the there. So this is an infected epidermal cyst. And this here is a 
femoral artery aneurysm in the groin, which is common among drug addicts eh, who inject directly into the femoral artery. What are the diagnostic evaluations that you have to undertake in these patients? Most important is a very, very careful history taking and physical examination. Eh? I must highlight to you the importance of this clinical examination in the patient to come to a diagnosis. Next, if it is cystic, you can do a transulubination test, okay, so which can differentiate between an encysted adrosyl of the cord or some other form of cyst that is located in the inguinal region. Ultrasound of the scrotum is done to rule out the presence of fluid and also can determine the nature of the contents, whether it is bowel or, or something, something else. Eh? Ultrasound of the scrotum and the inguinal region is also a very important examination in patients where clinical examination is not very helpful. Blood tests are done to rule out the, some form of infection in these patients. Okay, this is an ultrasound which I told you of the inguinal region here and the scrotum. Okay, this is the testis, right testicle testis here, and this is the inguinal canal which is occupied by the small intestine. Okay, intestine contains within the inguinal canal. So this is an inguinal hernia. This is a picture of an incisional hernia. This is a rectus sheet. There's a defect in the rectus sheet and invagination of contents from the abdomen, especially the intestine, into the subcutaneous space here. Okay, subrectal space, and this is your incisional hernia. This is a algorithm for the management of a patient with a groin hernia. Okay, there are a number of ways of classifying groin hernia uh, swellings, but I would prefer painful and painless. Some people classify as reducible and irreducible. Okay, but I prefer painless, painful and painless. The painful ones, okay, you can divide into non-hernia and hernia. Remember, hernia is the inguinal hernia is the most common uh, cause of groin swelling. Okay, so hernia most of the time needs surgery. After careful examination, you have to do surgery. It's the only definitive treatment. It can be either emergency or it can be elective surgery. Emergencies when there are complications like irreducibility, incarceration, strangulation, then you have to do it as immediately, yeah? emergency operation. Whereas the elective operation is patients who have no complications of the hernia. How do you diagnose this hernia? Basically, clinically, cough impulse and reducibility. These are very reliable findings, but in patients with complications like strangulation, cough impulse and it may be negative and the lump may not be reducible. Yes, in this patient, eh, it is not reducible. Okay, once you have diagnosed hernia, you classify them as emergency or elective. And then the various operations that can be done, hernia repair, hernioplasty, herniotomy, and operations on the bowel, such as release of additions or resection in cases of strangulated or complicated hernias. The non-hernias, there are a number of them, the painful ones, uh, usually referred pain, source abscess, lymphadenitis, and uh, infected cysts, okay? All these are painful swellings, eh? and then you do, carry out, you diagnose them and carry out the various uh, types of uh, treatment, IND, excision, biopsy, antibiotics, and analgesics. On the other hand, non-hernia cases, which are not urgent ones, will be lymphadenopathy, cyst, lipoma, saphina varix, and aneurysm of the femoral artery. So this is a simple algorithm for the management of a patient with groin hernias. Next, we continue with the second part on inguinal hernia.
These are five common types of hernia that are usually seen in our patients and among them, the most common is inguinal hernia. Okay, we check on for about 80% of all cases. A hernia is defined as the protrusion of part of whole of an organ or tissue to the wall of the cavity that normally contains it. An inguinal hernia occurs when an abdominal cavity contains enters into the inguinal canal. In most instances, it is the intestine that enters the inguinal canal through the deep and superficial inguinal rings. Inguinal hernia is the most common type of among the hernias, which accounts, as I said, 75 to 80 percent of all anterior abdominal wall hernias. Its prevalence is around 4 percent in those aged 45 years and above. Inguinal hernia are more common in males and is the most common hernia also in females apart from the incisional and femoral hernias. In the examination of a patient with inguinal hernia, the location of the deep inguinal ring is a very important part of the examination. In this respect, three important landmarks should be taken into consideration. First, the mid-inguinal point. Second, the midpoint of the inguinal ligament. And third, the inferior epigastric artery. The important landmarks that I mentioned just now are clearly highlighted in this slide, the diagram shown here of the pelvis. Okay, this is the left hemipelvis. This is the pubic bone. Okay, and this is joined to the opposite side in the midline. And that is the pubic symphysis, which lies in the midline. The upper lateral corner is a tubercle known as the pubic tubercle. Okay. The inguinal ligament attaches to the pubic tubercle on the medial side. And then laterally, it extends to the anterior superior iliac spine. Okay. This is the inguinal ligament and the midpoint as shown here by the red X is the midpoint of the inguinal ligament and the, the deep inguinal ring is situated about 1 to 2 centimeters above this midpoint. The other line is an imaginary line drawn from the pubic symphysis in the midline to the ASIS and the midpoint of this imaginary line is known as the mid inguinal point. Notice the mid inguinal point is above and medial to your midpoint of the inguinal ligament. And this mid inguinal point corresponds to the location of the femoral artery and the inferior epigastric artery which is given out from the femoral artery. The pubic tubercle is an important landmark which differentiates the femoral hernia and a direct hernia which is this is the superficial inguinal ring which is located above and medial to the pubic tubercle whereas femoral hernia is located below and lateral to the pubic tubercle. Okay, having said that, these are all shown in this diagram as well. Clearly, this blue line is the imaginary line that is drawn from the pubic symphysis to the ASIS. And this midpoint is known as the mid inguinal point, which is the location for the femoral artery and its branch, the inferior uh, epigastric artery. The red line is the inguinal ligament 
which extends from the ASIS to the pubic tubercle. And its midpoint is known as the midpoint of the inguinal ligament, which lies slightly lateral to the mid inguinal point. And the deep inguinal ring shown here, this arrow, is located around 1 to 2 centimeters above this midpoint of the inguinal ligament. Having said that, I must let you know of the controversies over the location of the deep inguinal ring. Some authors claim it is in the mid inguinal point. Others say it is in the midpoint of the inguinal ligament. But clinically, either it is in the mid inguinal point or the midpoint of the inguinal ligament is of little clinical significance. It is mainly a mere academic as clinically it's not very significant. The classification of in inguinal hernia. Generally, they are classified into two, direct inguinal hernia and an indirect inguinal hernia. The direct inguinal hernia, which accounts for 20% of all inguinal hernias, the bowel enters the inguinal canal directly through the weakness in the posterior wall of the canal which is termed the Hasselbeck Triangle. Usually this occurs in older patients, often secondary to abdominal wall laxity and significant increase in intra-abdominal pressure. The second group is the indirect inguinal hernia, which accounts for 80% of the cases. In this group, the bowel enters the inguinal canal via the deep inguinal ring. There are two components to these uh, contributing factors to this uh, indirect inguinal hernia. One is the congenital in nature, congenital in origin, incomplete closure of the processus vaginalis, which is an outpouching of the peritoneum allowing the embryonic testicular descent. Secondly, it is the weakness of the muscles guarding the, the deep inguinal ring, like a valve. And this indirect inguinal hernia usually occurs in children and young adults. This is another diagrammatic view of these uh, three important landmarks. This is the deep ring. Okay. This is the superficial ring, the weakness in the Hasselbeck triangle. The indirect inguinal hernia comes out okay, here through the deep ring and then it enters the inguinal canal. Whereas a super, uh, direct inguinal hernia comes out through the external, uh, through the posterior wall which is weakened, posterior wall of the inguinal canal and the hernia enters into this canal and goes towards the superficial inguinal ring. From there, it is then goes into the scrotum. Okay, so these are the two important marks and between these two is the inferior epigastric artery, which is a branch of the femoral artery. This inferior epigastric artery goes upwards and medially towards the midline of the lower abdomen. Okay, here this diagram again shows you a direct hernia where it, it, the hernia bulges through the thickness in the posterior abdominal wall medial to the inferior epigastric artery. And this then continues the journey towards and exits at the superficial inguinal ring to go into the scrotum. On the right here is an indirect hernia where the hernia exits the stomach and enters the inguinal canal through the deep inguinal ring, which is located lateral to the inferior epigastric artery and vein. It then continues its journey down within the inguinal canal and exits at the superficial inguinal ring into the scrotum. Okay, once it is in the scrotum, then 
the lump that is uh, is described as an inguinal scrotal swelling. That means it extends from the inguinal region into the scrotum. Okay, such swellings you cannot get above these swellings. It is not possible to palpate above and feel the swelling. That means it is continuous. There is no upper border of the swelling. So once there is no, you cannot get above the swelling. It is confirmatory for the diagnosis of indirect inguinal hernia. In the case of uh, purely scot truly scotal mass swelling, such as testicular mass, it is easy to get above the swelling. Okay, and it's possible to palpate above and feel the swelling. So this is unlikely to be due to a inguinal hernia. So if you cannot get above the swelling, scotal swelling, inguinal hernia is the diagnosis. If you can get above, unlikely to be inguinal hernia. Now we come to the etiology and the risk factors for inguinal hernia. Male, more commonly, more likely higher risk of developing hernia than female because of the uh, testicular descent part. Increasing age results in weakness of the posterior inguinal canal. Raised intra-abdominal pressure from chronic cough, heavy lifting, chronic constipation and benign prostatic hyperplasia. Obesity and congenital causes. This is usually the case in younger patients and children. Okay, some thoughts about congenital inguinal hernia, which occurs in childhood, sometimes just immediately after birth in premature children. Okay, these are the cases of inguinal hernia in children, where Patent processes vaginalis is the main cause of this hernia. Okay, the processes vaginalis is a part of the pre pre uh, precursor to the testicular descent from the retroperitoneum to the scrotum. Okay, the testis is in the retroperitoneum before birth. It travels down to reach the scrotum and by birth it is already in the scrotum in the majority of children. This, was, this is preceded by this in, uh, invagination of the peritoneum, posterior or retroperitoneal layer here and that is the processus vaginalis. In most children, this processus vaginalis is obliterated by birth but in some, some children it remains patent since even after birth and this patent processes vaginalis is the cause for the descent of the intestine into the scrotum as a indirect inguinal hernia. The descent of the uh, testes from the retroperitoneum is helped by the gubernaculum which attaches itself to the scrotum and by contraction pulls or the testes to the scrotum. Since the evagination of peritoneum is patent, there is fluid and intestine that can migrate into this, into this space. Therefore, in most cases in children, this hernia is usually associated with hydrocele, which can be scrotal or encysted. So the treatment for these cases will be a herniotomy, excision of the herniotomy sac, and if necessary, to drain of the hydrocele free. So that's known as herniotomy plus drainage. Next, we come to the clinical features of uh, inguinal hernia. There are two categories in this, in this group. One is the uncomplicated cases, uncomplicated hernia, where the most common presenting 
complaint is a lump in the groin. And the features of this lump in the groin, it is reducible. Usually in the early stages, it's reducible. It means it will disappear with minimal pressure or when the patient lies down supine. At times, there is some discomfort, which can usually is mild to moderate, which can worse with activity or standing. Very rarely, uncomplicated hernias produce severe pain. The second group is the complicated case, complicated hernias. And there are three types of complications. The incarcerated where it unable to be reduced, huh? irreducible, and the hernial contents, huh? especially the intestine, gets trapped in the hernial sac in the inguinal canal or the scrotum. And then they produce pain, tenderness, and erythema. The second, incarcer in incarcerated hernias can lead to bowel obstruction. And then they can have the signs, clinical features of intestinal obstruction, such as nausea, vomiting, abdominal distension, and inability to pass flatus and stool. And thirdly, strangulation results if the obstruction continues. And this is due to the impairment of blood supply to the intestine or the contents of the hernia and this occurs the hernia or the intestine can become infected and gangrenous leading to septicemia and shock which is a serious complication of hernia inguinal hernia okay when you examine a patient with any groin lump, the specific features to look for in these patients will be a cough impulse. Remember that an irreducible hernia may not have a cough impulse. So it is important to reduce the hernia and then check for cough impulse. If the cough impulse is positive, then most likely it is an inguinal hernia. Then the location of this uh, groin lump is important in the inguinal region. If it is superior and medial to the pubic tubercle, or in case of uh, inguinal hernia, or it is inferior and lateral to the pubic tubercle in femoral hernia. Okay, so the location of this lump, the neck of this lump will help to determine, uh, reveal whether it is a inguinal or femoral hernia. And thirdly, check for re reducibility, either spontaneous or minimum pressure. Ask the patient to lie down and observe, see whether the lump disappears. If it disappears, then it is called reducible hernia and it confirms the diagnosis of inguinal hernia. If you cannot reduce spontaneously, then apply some mild pressure to the lung to see whether it will be reduced. If it's an inguinal scrotal lung where the hernia has made its way into the scrotum, then see whether you can get above it or otherwise. If you cannot get above it, then it confirms the diagnosis of inguinal hernia. If you can get above the lump, then most likely it is a local cause in the testis or its covering, like a hydrocyl or a testicular mass, and unlikely to be a inguinal hernia. Now we come to differentiation, how to differentiate between inguinal hernia, whether it's direct or indirect, eh, clinically. This is a very important test which you are expected to do in exams. And this is known as the occlusion test. 
okay this is the occlusion test there are three simple steps to do this procedure first reduce the hernia with the patient lying down place finger pressure over the deep inguinal ring as we know it is located at the midpoint of the inguinal ligament and ask the patient to cough if the hernia protrudes despite occlusion of the deep inguinal ring this indicates a direct hernia if it does not protrude this indi it indicates it is an indirect hernia okay however having said this caution must be when, uh, taken this assessment clinically is often seen as unreliable, especially in patients who are obese and difficulty in locating the, the landmarks which I mentioned. And the only definite method to differentiate them is at the time of surgery. Okay, next we come to differential diagnosis of inguinal hernia or a mass confined to the groin or extends into the scrotum. The first scenario confined to the groin. So these are the common differential diagnoses. The most common ones are inguinal lymphadenopathy, localized lesions like lipoma, sebaceous cysts and groin abscesses. Rarer complication, a rarer differential diagnosis include femoral hernia, saphena varix, and a aneurysm of the internal ilia artery. If the swelling extends into the scrotum, as I showed you in the diagram earlier, it can be lesions within the scrotum, such as hydrocele, varicocele, or testicular mass. Now, what are the investigations that can should be done for these patients with hernia? Okay, diagnosis of hernia is basically a clinical one. Okay, it's a clinical diagnosis. Rarely we do need any other investigations to confirm the hernia. If at all, the imaging methods that are used is ultrasound. This is necessary in patients where the diagnosis is uncertain or you need to exclude some other pathology such as testicular mass in a patient with the inguinal scrotal mass. Apart from ultrasound, sometimes you may need a CT scan as well, but this is rare. Rarely you need a CT scan for a, to diagnose a patient of inguinal hernia. Abdominal X-ray, plain X-ray abdomen is sometimes useful, especially in complicated cases where they suspect intestinal obstruction. Okay, you need to do a supine and erect film, which will show multiple airfree levels and a distended small bowel. Now we come to the management of inguinal hernia. I must emphasize that definitive treatment is surgery. Okay, surgical repair is the definitive treatment for inguinal hernia, both direct and indirect hernia. Okay, when is uh, what are the indications for surgical intervention? The surgical intervention is for symptomatic inguinal hernia, and the patient has got pain, discomfort, or the swelling is big and causing him uh, discomfort and hampering his activities. Secondly, when they develop complications, incarceration, obstruction or strangulation. When these complications develop, there is some urgency in the treatment, surgical treatment of these patients, especially strangulation, which is a very serious complication, which must be treated with surgery as an emergency procedure. The risk of strangulation is about 3% per year with an inguinal hernia. 
Okay, the next is conservative treatment. Conservative treatment uh, can be con uh, carried out on patients who have, do not have any symptoms, but you must bear in mind the potential for complications is higher, especially in indirect inguinal hernia. Patients who are old, sickly and not fit for surgery may be considered for conservative treatment. Otherwise, all other patients should be considered for surgical treatment. In summary, this summarizes the treatment for direct and indirect hernia. For direct hernia, there is conservative treatment if the patient is not fit for surgery. Otherwise, if he develops complications, surgical treatment should be considered as soon as possible. For indirect inguinal hernia, surgery is the mainstay and the treatment of choice, unless there is some contraindication to surgery in that particular patient. The conservative treatment consists of the following. Reducing intra-abdominal pressure such as training, weightlifting, treat, getting treated for the constipation or the BPH that causes difficulty in passing urine, use of compression belts or truss okay, to prevent the hernia from protruding and also getting treated for cough, especially patients with aggress aggress uh, aggressive and chronic cough. Okay, these are pictures showing you the hernial compression belt, okay, which can be worn by patients, okay, especially when they are walking or standing or working and this can be removed while they are lying down or sleeping. This is a belt here. Next we come to the surgical repair of inguinal hernia which can be done either by open repair or laparoscopic repair. In the open repair the earliest procedure to be done is known as herniography okay or it's called or the bassini repair. In this repair, non-absorbable sutures in the form of a loop is used to strengthen the posterior wall of the inguinal canal, whereby this reinforces the, the wall and prevents the herniation of the contents. This was associated, this procedure is associated with a significant recurrence rate over the first five years. Hernioplasty is nowadays preferred. This is known as the mesh repair, and the technique used is Lichtenstein technique. A mesh from an in, uh, inabsorbable material and inabsorbable. Uh, synthetic material like proline is used to reinforce the posterior inguinal, uh, inguinal canal. This is not only reduces, is an easier operation, but it also reduces the recurrence rate. This can be performed under general anesthesia, spinal or local anesthesia, depending on the fitness of the patient. In children where the hernia is congenital due to a patent processus vaginalis, the operation done is known as a herniotomy. Okay, herniotomy is the excision of the uh, hernial sac, and by excising and lig ligating it, you are obliterating or removing the potential space of the uh, which is uh, provided by for the vagina, uh, processors vaginalis and thereby eliminating the space for further uh, recurrence of the hernia. 
At times, very often, it has to be associated with drainage of an hydrocele because most of these congenital hernia occur in very small children and is associated with hydrocele as well. Okay. This slide shows the principle of the Bassini repair of the posterior inguinal wall, where the transversely fascia and the conjoint tendon are switched to the inguinal ligament to strengthen the posterior wall behind the spermatic cord. And this is done by using non absorbable sutures. Okay, this is a open mesh repair. Okay, this is the spermatic cord which is retracted away to expose the posterior wall, and here is your deep ring. So there's a mesh placed in the posterior wall covering the deep ring as well, and this is then sutured all around. This reinforces and strengthens the posterior abdominal wall and prevents or the giving way to further recurrence of the hernia. Okay, This is a mesh. Normally we use a proline mesh. In fact, nowadays there are so many prosthetic uh, materials that can be used as meshes. Okay, This is placed underneath here. The next one is laparoscopic repair. These days, minimally invasive surgery or laparoscopic surgery has become the ideal treatment or the preferred treatment because of the less pain and faster recovery. So laparoscopic repair is indicated for bilateral hernias, okay, recurrent inguinal hernias, the repair is associated with some risk to injury to the local structures. Patients for high risk of chronic pain, and I think this patient may develop chronic pain, the laparoscopic method would help to reduce this risk. And in some females where you cannot rule out a femoral hernia, so a laparoscopic method will be more preferable to deal with such patients. There are two types of repair. One is known as a total extraperitoneal repair, TEP, or transabdominal preperitoneal repair, TAPP. Okay, both are equally good and effective in preventing recurrences, reducing the pain, and also cost effective. In general, Laparoscopic repairs are associated with, may be associated with longer operative times, a quicker post operative recovery, fewer complications, and less post operative pain. Okay, this is the entry ports, free entry ports. And this is, as I said, this is the deep inguinal ring through which the hernia protrudes into the inguinal calan and scrotum. Okay, this is a picture showing you the laparoscopic operation. This is the internal ring where the hernia has gone in. So this hernia is reduced and a mesh is placed away. Okay, here a mesh is placed in away. And this mesh is anchored all around the periphery, the staples. So this is a simplified treatment algorithm for inguinal hernia. You've got primary unilateral inguinal hernia, which can be done with open method. If there's risk of chronic pain, then you can opt for laparoscopic repair. And in some females, where you think you may have a femoral hernia, then a laparoscopic repair Will be more ideal. Primary bilateral goes straight for laparoscopic repair. Recurrent inguinal hernia goes straight for laparoscopic repair. Complications of hernia, which I've already mentioned, incarceration or irreducibility 
where the contents get trapped into the in the urinal canal or the scrotum. Strangulation where the cut off of the blood supply due to pressure. Strangulation at the neck of the inguinal hernia. This is especially so for indirect inguinal hernia where the strangulation occurs at the deep ring. The other complication is bowel obstruction. Patient presents with abdominal distension, vomiting, nausea and constipation. Okay, this is a loop that was in the in the hernia sac, which is strangulated at the neck. And here, because of ischemia, the bowel becomes infected, and this needs to be resected. Okay, this is a strangulated hernia, a complication of inguinal uh, in hernia. Postoperative complications of, uh, of hernia repair. These those in green here are the most common complications. Pain, bleeding, leading to bruising and hematoma, especially scrotal hematoma, infection due to the placement of a foreign body mesh, urine retention. The, the recurrence is another important complication which roughly occurs approximately 1% within the first five years of surgery. Chronic pain, okay, persists for three months after the hernia repair, can occur up to 30% of patients and disabling pain in about 2% of patients. Damage to the vas deferens and testicular vessels leading to infertility is another possibly com possible complications, but usually it is not common. Then we come to the emergency management of hernia. Normally hernia, uncomplicated, you do a selective operation. Once there are complications, serious complications, then you have to go for emergency operation, especially for strangulation of the intestine. Strangulated hernias okay, can lead to bowel infarction and gangrene perforation and septicemia. So strangulated hernias must be done as an emergency. Okay, immediately as soon as the patient is stabilized, fluid replacement, antibiotics and then taken to OT for exploration. And, and the surgery involves surgical exploration, reduction of the hernia which, will, which may result in spontaneous revascularization or if necessary bowel resection and anastomosis if the bowel is already infected. Subsequently the mesh repair of the hernia is done and antibiotics cover is very important in strangulation strangulated cases and also it, I must stress the importance of fluid and electrolyte replacement in patients with strangulation. So what are the key take-home points from this, from this lecture? Okay, first, an inguinal hernia can be classified as direct or indirect. The diagnosis is a clinical one and only warrants further investigation if there is diagnostic uncertainty. In direct inguinal hernia, surgery must be done as soon as possible. Direct inguinal hernia can be treated conservatively unless complicated. Conservative treatment, especially for patients who are not fit for anesthesia and surgery. Most cases of hernia are repent via open approach unless it's bilateral or recurrent. 
But today, laparoscopic repair is becoming more and more a standard procedure compared to the open approach. Thank you for joining me for this session on groin swellings and inguinal hernia. Thank you.